Hello my friends and welcome back and happy hump day. I've been wanting to say that for two weeks ever since I learned from the comments that Wednesday is the hump day. In Estonia we call it the spine of the week so we're breaking the spine of the week. We survived the first two days. But you know what didn't and I got to say it yesterday it's beautiful. Russian patrol ship Sergei Gotov which was sunk yesterday and now we have a video also. First thing today we're gonna do, we're gonna watch the video so you get a lot of dopamine out of that and then we can go on. Look at this my friends, it's beautiful. GU War Special Unit 13 and this is Sergei Gotov, the patrol ship, but a boom, it goes to space, much like T-90s and their turrets. The ships also want to be cool like the tanks, so they're also exploding the space. Now this is the second drone already following the first one, also connecting to the hull of the ship. Altogether the ship was hit to two different sides and to the back, so there's no way it survived. Second explosion, big fireworks, bada bim, bada boom. No more Sergei Gotov. In Russian, Gotov means finished, so Sergei is now Gotov. <laughs> oh, there's more, the video goes on and on. Look at this one, this is the third explosion and it connects also to the side and it's a Beautiful, magnificent explosion, knocked out cold. And ever since I started with this, I want to say it. It's sleeping with the fishes. It's now turned into submarine. You can see it's burning, it's taking on water. The crew was on board about 50 to 70, we don't know exactly, but that's a lot of troops. I mean, a lot of sailors, marines, how do you call them? Servicemen. They were mostly rescued though by Russian Navy, Black Sea Fleet. Now we can even see inside of the ship, the last previous explosion ripped such a big hole into the hull. This drone opens up the insides of the ship to us. There are wiring right here. It's all broken. I mean, this huge gasp of a hole, you don't fix this. Damage control has nothing to do with this. This is abandoned ship time. Do we see? Oh, we see another one. Huge explosion. Now these drones, they carry a lot of explosives. Since flying this much explosives is quite difficult. Uh, floating them on water, marine drones, it's, it's much easier to do. So they carry a lot more than a Shahed drone, which carries 40 kilograms. They carry over 100, well over 100. My friends, it's already old news that Ukraine, a country without a navy, has been able to push the Russian Black Sea fleet away from Sevastopol and away from open waters. Also, Ukraine has been shooting down the Russian A-50 AWACS. In the last two months, two of them have been shot down and they, both of these things have directly influenced the battlefield. I'll read you a short report. The spokesperson for Ukraine's southern military group reported that for the past two weeks, Russian missile capable ships have not ventured out into the Black Sea. Now why don't they do that? Well, because the marine drones will hunt them down immediately and turn them into submarines. And Russia right now, as weird as it sounds, doesn't want more submarines. So they keep their ships in the port, trying to keep them safe, they don't want to lose them. The loss of the Black Sea fleet base and the headquarters in Sevastopol and the end of reconnaissance flight by A-50 AWACS planes are presumably presumably the main reason for this silence. Also the loss, uh, this means that Russia has less missile carriers on the open waters, less missile attacks against Ukraine, less coordinated missile and aviation attacks since the A-50 is not flying. So Ukraine has been able to push the A-50 away and the Russian Black Sea fleet away while doing it in a very cheap and cost-effective way. No Navy and the A-50 also was pushed away probably by only one single Patriot launcher that was brought in from Kiev and then brought back to Kiev. It's not even on the front lines. So Ukraine is not tying up their air defense or their marine drones since they produce more and more of them, but Russia has to pull everything back. It is beautiful. My friends, but now we jump to more gloomy news. This is the huge Shahed factory in Russia. Yes, the Iranian Shahed 136 drone, which is mass manufactured and mass produced in Russia in a huge factory. Russia has gotten it running. They worked on it the entirety of 2023 and now it's up and running and producing a lot of drones. When I say a lot, I mean hundreds per month. Russia is mass producing Iranian Shahed drones which act like cruise missiles except 
200 to 400 times cheaper. Now, I want to open up, since this uh, user here doesn't really understand how Russian military procurement system works. These drones cost only a few thousand dollars to make. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Twitter user, I gotta fix you here. The Shahed drone, without corruption, without any kind of Russian procurement issues, costs a few hundred thousand to make. It doesn't cost a few thousand. It's an, ex it's an expensive drone compared to the cheapest mass-produced kamikaze drones, but it has to be because it has insane range and it can carry a lot of explosives. It carries 40 kilograms, the old Shahed's. The newer ones carry even more. It's a good drone. Why do I say good? Yes, it's loud and slow, it's easy to shoot down, but it's very mass producible. You can make a lot of them and you don't need very high-tech components to do so. And when you make hundreds or thousands per month, you can soak up enemies anti-aircraft fire like Russia is doing for Ukraine right now. But the thing with these Shahets is, yes, let's say it costs 100,000 to make. Relatively cheap compared to the Tsia Reaper drone. But Ukraine shoot down ratio of Shahed drones is close to 90%. So every thousand Shahed drones sent to Ukraine, 900 are confirmed shot down by Gepards and other anti-aircraft fire, even some improvised, let's take it the more, most robust version, Kalashnikovs tied together and sh the three Kalashnikovs and they're shooting down the drones. They're very easy to shoot down if you have the correct radars. 90% are lost. That pushes the successful Shah had hit price up to, I remember the statistics because I covered this a month ago, up to a million. So a, a successful Shah had explosion on target is around a million USD because if those 10% hit, out of those 10, only 5-6% actually hit their target, the rest miss their targets. So the successful hit is incredibly expensive. It is not that rosy that it's so cheap. Russia is pouring billions, yes, billions into making Shahed drones. They're not that cheap if they're all shot down. Russian defense ministry got hacked recently by Ukrainian hacking groups, uh, vigilantes, and they leaked the documents about the new Shahed drones to us. And I'll summarize them very fast to you to save your time. This new Shahed drone that Russia is about to start producing, it has a range of 2,000 kilometers. Now this user says that it's a silent but deadly force. I gotta say, it's not silent in any way. It's very loud in both the radar cross section and in physical sound waves. You can hear it coming and you see it on the radar. It's not loud, but it does have a lot of range and that's a huge plus for this drone. Now if Russia would be able to actually procure these drones without the corruption money and without 90% without, uh, of them being shot down, then it would be a cheap, mass-producible drone that soaks up the enemy fire, it's a good drone. But since the corruption money add this to the fact that 90% are shot down, it's not cheap, it's not silent, it's even not cost-effective. <laughs> Measuring 3.5 meters in length with a 3 meter wingspan, it's, it's a big drone. It's a compact de design with its lethal capabilities, armed with 50 kilograms of payload. Now, the previous version had 40 kilograms, and the thing with Shahads is all, always, it's easy to shoot down, you shoot them down, but if they do hit, that 5% that actually connects the target is doing a lot of damage, because the 40 kilograms of explosive, they make a big boom. Big bada beam bada boom. It's really bad. So now it's 50, it's even worse. Powered by an internal combustion engine with 50 horsepower, the MC236 can loiter for 12 hours, cruising at 170 kilometers per hour. Uh, the weapon is a persistent threat. Powered by 50 horsepower engine, internal combustion engine. Now this is what makes the Shahed extremely mass producible to Russia because they don't really have to rely that much on Chinese parts for it since it's not electric. China mass produces millions of these uh, electric battery drones, but this is internal combustion, which Russia can just produce internally. So this is very unfortunate since they it's like their BTR or BMP. It's stupid iron. It's a metal box, but they can produce so many of them that it becomes a problem. Shahed the same way. Most of them don't hit, but just this, the sheer volume of them made is an issue for Ukraine. I'm not going to read you the rest of it, but Shahed drone as an idea is exactly for Russian and the former Soviet Union uh, offensive doctrine. 
where you strike with volume, not with quality. Shahad drone is not quality in any way. It's slow, it's loud, it's a stupidly huge radar cross-section, it's easy to shoot down. But the fact that you could produce just thousands, if not tens of thousands, by not needing parts from China or any other country, it's unfortunately makes this a perfect drone for Russia. Now, my friend, we look at another Russian weapon system that... Uh, in, even in Russian sense, I cannot call success in any way. I could call Shahed a success in some categories, but this next one, no, not success in any way. We're talking about the T90. I'll bring you a thread from Twitter user Sander, which uh, summarizes this topic in a short and nice way, so to save your time. The T90 and its variants equipped with powerful 1000 plus hor horsepower V12 diesel engine and a 125 millimeter smooth bore gun Composite armor and other modifications by Variant was much feared bulwark of Russia's army. So what went wrong? The CEO of the Russian company that makes Armata T-14 just admitted this week that the Armata is a failure because it's too expensive and they will never be mass produced. I want to say t so much, told you so, it will never happen. It's too much for Russia. Russia can only produce volume not quality, but quantity in the cheapest, most mass producible way. Now the T-90 now is and always has been the most modern Russian battle tank. Now this tank is lack lacking the production quality is necessary for quantity and it is lacking quality. It is just a bad tank. We'll get into it. It's not just hate. We'll analyze it actually. In a week, over 100 T-72s, T-80s and T-90 variants were identified as destroyed on top of a host other vehicles. Russian losses have been catastrophic and far beyond what they can reasonably sustain. At least 30% of the T-90 variants built appear to have been destroyed. Russia still produces T-72s, T-80s and T-90s. All of these three variants of tanks, of course, the most Russian or Soviet doctrine tank, meaning its quantity and it's cheap and mass producible, is T-72 not T-19 anyway. Russia still produces them around 30 a month, so 30 T-90s. The carousel autoloader has been disastrous for crews and tanks alike. The infamous high-flying turrets are known to any watching of the war. Their design, now 30 years old, is lacking so many up-to-date protections. Composite and reactive armor is clearly not as robust as Western tanks. The fact that Bradleys have taken them out with gunfire says a great deal. Bradley 25mm Bushmaster explosive ammunition. I remember the video, Bradley was hammering down toof, 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 and the T90 went kaboom. Beautiful. It's also unbelievably slow in reverse. And listen to this. This is really important on the battlefield where you're on the minefield. It can only do four kilometers per hour backwards. You might say, oh, you don't need to go backwards. Yes, you do. Especially if Russians most commonly used offensive uh, doctrine is a huge armored convoy, which usually will be bogged down by a Ukrainian artillery fire. First or second tank is destroyed, or the last tank is destroyed. You need to back up to get out of the convoy and press forward or go, or go back. There's a lot of reasons this backward speed of four kilometers per hour is horrible and results in direct Russian deaths on the battlefield. It, ca it can take so much time to get out of the difficult situation. Its sluggish character makes it easier to hit, a weakness often exploited by Ukraine. Overall, the T-90 is cheap, but not ideal. Long supposed to have been superseded by the T-14 Armata, never going to happen. That mechanized tragedy on tracks has singularly failed to even reach serious production. We're talking about the T-14 now. Ironically, Russia prefers quantity over quality, but the T-90 is neither sufficiently available to provide one or good enough to be uh, other. It is too expensive to be strong in quantity. It costs 3.5 million USD. I mean, it's Russia cannot mass produce anything that costs that much. And that is just the labor and parts. It's not the corruption money, because in any weapon system in Russia, the procurement officers takes a huge portion, we're not talking about 10%, we're talking like one third, and in addition to the price of the weapon system, just to the officer who procures it. Its weakness in the wrong situation overweighs its capabilities. While on the occasion it is in the right place at the right time, it often lacks the performance to do the job it's intended for. 
Just a horrible tank, it's a failure. Like the T40 in Armata, well at least the T90 is in a production, is right now being produced, they have the logistical chain set up, only 30 a month, but it's just a bad tank. My friends, a few days ago, Russian uh, security officers leaked two German army officers discussing in a phone call how to blow up the Kerch Bridge. And now this is a Russian information operation. This conversation really happened, but the leak was done deliberately by Russia to frighten Germany and to weaken their image in other NATO countries' eyes that Germany is infiltrated by Russian spies. Which unfortunately is true, I cannot deny it. German leadership has a soft spot for Russian intelligence, unfortunately. I'll read you the report, because it causes a lot of discussion right now in the world. There continue to be lively discussions in the media about the conversations leaked from German military personnel regarding support for Ukraine. Russia correctly estimated that the leak would create serious media pressure on the German government, thus forcing the government members into a defensive position. Russian officials are amplifying the effect with additional statements accusing Germany of wanting to attack Russia, which Olaf Scholz is most afraid of. He's afraid of their past, the Germany's past. If anybody mentions it, he pulls back immediately. No more supplies for Ukraine. Russian propagandists have already published reports that if Germany transfers Taurus missiles to Ukraine, various bridges and other objects in Germany would be attacked which ch certainly is not true. Russia assumes that Germany will now uh, strongly pull back its aid to Ukraine as the German government is considered susceptible to Russian pressure. But my friends, this is not even the most important information bit coming out of this leaked audio call. Something much more interesting is happening. British troops are in this call confirmed to be stationed in Ukraine, aiding the Ukrainians with storm shadow. Yes, you heard correctly, British troops in Ukrainian so on Ukrainian soil aiding with storm shadow. Now this information uh, is secret, was secret before the leak. The British have military personnel in Ukraine which help load the storm shadow and scalp missiles. The British remotely via reach back do the mission planning for the storm shadow missiles. Germans are afraid that if Ukrainians do the mission planning themselves, the Taurus can hit a kindergarten. <laughs> so the British send troops to Ukraine, they don't care, and the Germans are afraid. Fear is a choice, my friends. I say it all the time, and unfortunately, Germans choose to be afraid right now. Let's hope this changes. Now, this goes in connection with at least four countries right now saying that they're not opposing NATO troops or their country's troops to be sent into Ukraine. First of all, France. Emmanuel Macron started this. Suddenly, he has a lot of balls. I don't know where he got them from, but suddenly he's speaking all out against Russia and speaking about sending French troops into Ukraine. I gotta say respect, man. Then we have Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Gallas saying the same thing. They, then we have Netherlands. The list of countries is being longer and longer and now we know we have British troops already in Ukraine. <laughs> what a day, my friends. Happy hump day. Now, my friends, gloomy news again. I'll try to put one news and another news not to overwhelm you or make you depressed. But this one is a bit sad, but it was bound to happen. I'm even surprised it took so long. First, confirmed HIMARS launcher has been lost. Russians attacked it with an Iskander missile, as you can see it, see it on the footage. This is visually confirmed to be a HIMARS system. Now it took Russians two years of hunting to hit one, and they were hunting. I mean, HIMARS have, has been the single most deadly on-ground weapon system for Russian troops in Ukraine. So they have been hunting it. It's the not high-value target, but the target. And it took two years to take down one. Well, I'm sure Russian propagandists and Russian military bloggers will praise this to the moon and saying Ukraine is done, but uh, Ukraine has a lot more of them. <laughs> so thank you, HIMARS, for your great service. Incredible job. It's, it's, if I would say any weapon system on the ground right now is a Wunderwaffe, I would say it's HIMARS. What it has done single-handedly is insane. My friends, yesterday my fiance told me that, can you get go to Facebook? Because I can't. I went, I couldn't also. Then I couldn't go to Instagram also. I was like, what the hell is going on? Instagram, Facebook are down. I didn't know what to think about it. And then it became, it was X and then it was Google and YouTube. It became sinister and sinister. I had a lot of questions. I went to, and, and today I wake up to this message and I'll read it to you. It's much bigger than just some small disruption. It is connected 
to Ukrainian war very directly, which I definitely didn't suspect at the time of the disruption. The worldwide internet disruption is but another episode that if you don't deal with the enemies of the civilized world, then sooner rather than later they will come for us. Today it is an undersea cable destroyed by Houthi terrorists, tomorrow it is Russian missiles and drones destroying your neighborhood. You see who the rebels are right now very actively seeking and trying to sink western merchant ships or military ships and right here you see it's one of the most concentrated area of underwater cables that connect the world wide web let's call it like that the world wide internet one of these was damaged or destroyed by the Houthi terrorists resulting in disruptions in three of the biggest platforms, social media platforms online. Now, how is this connected to Ukrainian war? I'll open it up like, a, to, like as simple as I understand it. Who the rebels get most of their funding and support from Iran? Iran is under sanctions from the Western powers and they need money to operate and they need weapons to operate, they need in engineers to operate. They get all of that from Russia because they supply the Shahed drones to Russia. Russia is striking, attacking Ukraine and also getting ammunition from North Korea. So we have the new axis which is Iran, Syria, North Korea, Russia, who the rebels of course and it all goes back to Russia. North Korea is getting money from Russia, Iran is getting money from Russia, Syria is getting money from Russia. Some African dictators are getting money from Russia. You don't need to fight who the rebels in North Korea. You take out Russia from the equation, it all comes crumbling down. They're the evil empire. My friends, from this video you can see a set of 20 prepared FPV drones ready on an Ukrainian front line. Prepare for an enemy assault. This is the minimum number ready and prepared for any any moment, any second, because the assault might come, the convoy suddenly 10 tanks and 100 Russian troops are running your way, you gotta set these babies immediately into the air destroying these uh, occupiers. But this is what the drone looks like and a big RPG-7 round attached to the bottom of this, the drone, a huge battery attached on the top and it looks like a bumblebee. It shouldn't be able to fly with such a narrow skinny frame and, and blades but it does and it flies very fast and accurate. This is the drones we provide to Alpha Group and you bought them. You have bought over 250 of them already through me and Noel and I have delivered all of them with uh, 69 Sniffing Brigade. Here is the latest delivery in January to you. I'll play the whole video so you see again the, not the similarities, but this is the exact same drone that we give. <laughs> My friends, the moment is here. You have done it before and you did it again. These are one of the most cost-effective way to destroy Russian tanks. These are small kamikaze drones. They cost in between $500 and $800. Russian tank cost above half a million to more. So taking a tank out with one of these drones is the most beautiful thing that can happen. So you are giving the Ukrainian units a possibility to liberate their land with these beautiful drones. With me are standing two guys from SBU Alpha, the best Ukrainian special forces unit and their kill ratio with the drones is unbelievably off the charts. So you are most directly influencing the outcome of this war by giving these drones to the Ukrainian special forces. Thank you my friends. Slava Ukraini. My friends, now we'll watch a video of how the process of making Russian live men into meat uh, ground meat or minced meat happens <clears throat> in a village somewhere in Russia as you can see we analyzed the hell out of this video because it says a lot much more than it's intended with this video there's a tractor cleaning the driveway of snow now if it's uh, in the middle of nowhere in Russia this would never happen but it happens now usually citizens have to clean it themselves because you know Russia doesn't care but it happens now because this truck here couldn't get through so they cleaned it especially with a tractor so the truck could get through. And what was the truck carrying? Well, my friends, it was carrying the man of the house in a zinc gasket, minced meat of the house. Brought it back in a zinc casket from Ukraine to the family and there's the mother coming out. So they cleared the driveway of snow for the truck. 
to bring this in casket, they put a Russian flag in the snow. And now the tractor is still clearing for the truck to be able to come out later also. This is the first and last time probably this family sees this tractor doing this service for the family because they don't have any more sons to send to die for Putin. Now this is how the process, this is the circle of life in Russia. You live as a man, 25, 30 years old. You get a paper saying, go to Ukraine. You go to Ukraine and you return in the zinc casket and at least they clear the driveway for you. My friends, yesterday Ukraine was very active with drones. I guess Zelensky felt like he wants more Russian oil depots knocked out cold. And I'll read them to you to save your time <clears throat> very quickly. There was an oil depot in Kursk and Ukrainian drones went bada bim bada boom. Now it's on fire. The usual story. Later I'll open up a little bit why oil depot fires are so hard to extinguish and how much damage do they really do. It's much more than meets the eye. Then there's the Tuva thermal plant. Now this wasn't actually Ukrainian drones. It was an explosion in the boiler room. But the thing is still the same. Oil depots or thermal plants, Russia. A country with one of the biggest fossil fuel reserves is having issues with providing people with heat and electricity and fuel since they also banned uh, diesel and petroleum products to be exported. It shouldn't be like that. But it is because Ukraine can hurt Russia really bad. And now there's the final one yesterday, which is Belgorod oil depot. You can see it also on the screen. Another hit. These oil silos, they cannot be extinguished. They burn to the ground because they're filled with combustibles raw oil or, uh, or refined oil, it doesn't really matter. It burns like hell. Now the thing is, oil depots or oil refineries actually, if they burn and Ukraine strikes them also to lessen Russian capabilities of getting money by selling them, and it's already working. Have, you have seen these oil uh, refineries, a lot of tubes everywhere, oil silos. It's like a mixture of very complex engineering. You, you look at it, it's like, wow, what we what? This looks very awesome and, and industrial. Now, if you hit that, of course, the oil will burn. It's really bad. It spews it everywhere. But the thing is, it has a lot of wiring underground and in the air and everywhere. Wiring, copper wiring. Now, if there's a fire and there's copper wires in the fire and they go a few kilometers into all of the plant around it, heat will transfer from the wires. And I don't know this. I know this because uh, Arthur's army officer and uh, a genius engineer, Heiner from Canada, told me this. I'll be saying to you what he told me. And he knows about this stuff. <laughs> he knows everything. The heat transfers from the source of the fire, from the wires itself. The plastic around will melt, of course. But the heat transfers from copper to a kilometer kilometer away. So the fire is here, the whole factory is one, two square kilometers filled with these wires. This one source of fire can transfer heat, insanely hot copper wiring all across the factory, destroying every last electrical bit inside that factory. Although the exact fire location was really small, the whole factory is screwed and replacing those wires is basically rebuild the entire factory. So these small fires you see in Russian refineries, oh, it doesn't do much, it's just, look, three square meters, little bada boom. It's much more sinister than that. This refinery will not work properly for months, if not years, resulting in hundreds of millions in the end, all combined, of loss to Russia. My friends, I've been wanting to say this for a long time, but Europe is finally gearing for war. The European Commission is proposing the EU member states to increase the capacity of the defense industry, which is a significant part of the process of achieving European independent defense capability. Finally, I've been saying, all we gotta say to the United States is thank you and move on. Now we have to wake up. It's our responsibility to defend Ukraine and accept Ukraine into the ranks. It's our continents, it's our Europe, United States should not have to protect another continent like that. European leaders are sleeping. Time to wake up. My friends, thank you for coming back time and time again. If you survived today, then we have survived half of the week, three days out of seven. It's not half, but it's a hump day. So congratulations, my friends. Tomorrow, we're going to survive Thursday. So be back. Until my next video, Slavo Ukraini, and bye-bye.